be happy to know we will be staying inside for class um, just as a, as a sort of heads up I know we have a two and a half hour block in general for this class this class is likely to run a bit short until it warms up outside for a reasonable I think reason okay so today at the end of class we're gonna spend a little time up in the greenhouse practicing some of the terms we're gonna learn today in lecture but before we do that Apologize, we did not get to grading everyone's labs, so those grades aren't up yet. But I do want to make sure that we all kind of understood the general point of the lab, which was to learn how to use the dichotomous key, because we will be using keys a lot in this class as we go through our different groups of plants. Okay. So what we were looking at last time, we were using a field guide, specifically the Minnesota Trees Field Guide, to identify some of these conifers. So on the first page of that conifer section, there was a dichotomous key, which was that series of statements that you run through one by one to figure out what you're looking at. Other types of books that tend to have dichotomous keys are floras. Um, flora is a word for plants, but floras is also a type of kind of manual for plants. Also, there are manuals to plants. Um, we'll take a look at some of those in the future. We have some in the other room. So we don't need them for right now. The reason I didn't pull one of those out for our last lab is they start to use some really specific plant terms, which we haven't learned yet. Okay. Manuals usually contain the most descriptive information. Our field guide was just kind of a good balance of descriptive information as well. Floras are sometimes just a bunch. One of the things we want to realize about these resources is that they're usually specific to a particular area and also a specific type of plant. So for example, the field guide we were using was specific to Minnesota and the section we were using was specific to conifers. So it's important to realize these aren't exhaustive lists and you're going to have to pick the right resource to identify any particular plant. So you're going to want to pay attention to where you are if you're trying to identify a plant, or if I give you a specimen from a herbarium upstairs, they're labeled where they're collected. So that's going to be important information to pay attention to. And then we're going to want to be able to key in on some basic groupings within plants, which is part of what we'll be doing in this course. So just to make sure that everybody understands how to use the key, because I know some people were um, doing a lot of comparing to pictures I saw, tried to get around and, and practice keys with most of you, but I, I don't know that I got to everyone. So here I have the key up on the board to the coniferous key trees. That was on that first page of the section. So what you see is it's a series of couplets, paired statements, so we can see that they have numbers, right? Um, so 
You want to kind of drag to center that conifer that I have at the end. We're going to practice this on one of them. You can break off pieces. The way we were doing this, we start with the first statement number one. All right, so first we're assessing whether or not our leaves were scale like or all shaped, which there were some small pictures on the previous page telling us what that looked like, or whether 1B, the leaves were linear shaped. So we're starting sort of out here at the top of the outline with these one statements. So 1A and 1B is this first couplet, this first set of paired statements. So for that conifer you have in front of you, I'll just tell you because I didn't pull up the scale like first all like first linear page for you. But these leaves are linear shaped. So they're flattened in cross section if you slice through one of the leaves, or maybe kind of needle-like. So now that we're at 1B, we'll be assessing. Uh, the next level in, right? So we've jumped from 1B to now we're on question three. Because this is a kind of choose your own adventure, right? So the only way we would get to this second couplet is if we answered yes to 1A. Okay. So we're at 1B, so now we're at three. So now we're going to be looking at 3A versus 3B, whether our leaves are in clusters or whether they're single. So take a look what's in front of you just to, to confirm or jog your memory from last week. Somebody want to tell me where we should be 3A or 3B for these little leaves? Yeah, exactly. So these are single leaves. So we're at 3B. So next we go to question five. And we're looking at each of those individual leaves. We're trying to figure out whether it's four sided or whether it's flattened, basically. Hopefully, you can see uh, that it's flattened. Those needles are flattened. Um, Spruces happen to be one of the groups that we didn't have represented here in the lab. So hopefully you guys maybe found a spruce somewhere outside. Okay. So these leaves are linear shaped or flattened, but then we're evaluating question six, whether it's on peg-like stalks or whether uh, they have whitish, whitish cushions and smooth margins, which hopefully it does, six B which brings us to seven. So we know we have one of these kinds of firs and we should have gotten to 7B, the tree fir. So at this point, it's when you would have consulted those descriptions and images. So you know that everything you're looking at there would be on page 17 or potentially page 16 if you can't tell whether it's seven or seven. So this is important to understand because while this guy's the conifers, was pretty small, didn't have all that many pages, and you could conceivably read the whole thing. If you have a more comprehensive group, a larger group with a lot more individuals, you don't want to be comparing to a hundred different pages of descriptions and pictures. All right, but you might have a key that tells you where to go in those 100, 200 pages. Um, it happens to be the case that when you create a key like this, there are 10 items to identify. There would be nine different couplets. Um, so it's always true that the number of things you have, you need to come up with n minus one sort of question. So we can see here, we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight pages that they sent you to in this case. And so we had seven couplets. This just will be true when you create a key like this which you will notice when you make your own for, for your project at the end of the semester. That's part of why we're going over the structure here. We're going to be using these keys, and you're going to write me a key so that I can identify your collections 
when you uh, create those in there. So here we would have taken ourselves to page 17. And at this point, we would have compared to the image as well as the description. So this is where we would start double checking what we're looking at. So in this case, it happens to be a balsam fir. So we might have confirmed that uh, by looking at the length of those leaves, looking at this description of the twigs. Um, I cut this tree down myself, so it's helpful that the range is native to northeastern Minnesota, which is where we are, right? Um, but we see that there are some other similar species. We can see that these are all within the same genus. So these firs are all um, an actual biological group. They don't just look similar. Any questions on how to use these keys? So this is how we're going to be identifying plants in the future. Okay. So this is just a comparison of a dichotomous key to what a phylogeny might look like. So when we're using a dichotomous key, what we're trying to do is identify something, right? If we're trying to identify something, that means we have to be able to observe those traits. Right? It's not going to help us if we have a field guide out in the woods and it says, oh, this plant has blah, 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 G. It's not going to help. Um, so dichotomous keys and phylogenies don't always mirror each other exactly. It is true that morphology, so the size and shape of things, reflects gene, right? So, so they often will guide us to groups like those firs. Um, but we will also have potentially convergent evolution where we have plants that look similar but aren't coming from the same way. So if we have a branching tree like this with a bunch of scientific terms, that's our phylogenetic tree. The previous thing with those lists of couplets, that's our dichotomous tree. So this happens to be a phylogeny of conifers, largely. Um, so here we see that we're in the division kind of phyta, and here are some of the families we were looking at. So we had selected species from within these families that are found in Minnesota. Okay. With that said, we're going to move on to some more technical terms with some more uh, properties of plants today so that we can build on our terminology, be able to use more complex keys and be able to talk about some of these plant families in specific ways. So this course is largely going to focus on something called vascular plants. When we say a plant is vascular, what we mean is it contains vessels, kind of like blood vessels. They have vascular tissue that carry fluid. So in the case of plants, our vascular tissue we have two types, we have xylem and we have phloem. Usually it's arranged longitudinally, so lengthwise down the long part of our plant. So kind of the way arteries and veins are in an animal. Right? So the difference between the two is largely in, in kind of the direction it's going and also in what trans it's transporting. So if we're talking about xylem, we're talking about vascular tissue that's bringing things from the root out to the leaves. Largely what we're bringing out to the leaves is water, but other dissolved substances from the soil, mostly minerals, are also going to be found in the xylem. So these minerals, these trace minerals that the leaves will need, that the plants will need for growth, for doing it. Processes. Opposite type of vascular tissue is called phloem. So phloem is going from the leaves out to the rest of the plant. So most of what this is going to be uh, is sugars from photosynthesis. So you're getting photosynthesis in the leaves, we're taking light, we're getting energy out of that light, we're storing it. So the phloem will be transporting dissolved organic material, inorganic material around from the leaves to the rest of the plant. Oh, anybody think of 
a type of plant they would not expect to have vascular tissue in. I think you wouldn't expect sort of the blood vessel stuff to be in. Uh, cactuses actually do count as a vascular plant, but that's a good guess. Um, so in terms of vas non-vascular plants, we're going to be thinking really small stuff, basically. Um, so algae are technically plants, right? But they're very small, just, you know, a couple of clumps of cells. Mosses, also very flat, close to the ground. Um, these plants are small enough <coughs> that they don't need this vascular tissue to carry around dissolved substances. Um, they can absorb it through the plant itself. So we don't need to transport material in the uh, smaller plants, basically. So those are avascular plants, the algae and the mosses, technical terms for which is bryophyte, are going to have three major groups within vascular plants. They're going to be divided based on their reproductive strategies, so how we make more of that plant. And as we'll see, there, there are basically three types of reproductive strategies. But the main group are the teratophytes, which are going to be ferns and things like ferns. The second group is going to be gymnosperms and kinophyta. So that's really uh, the conifers that we were talking about on Thursday, as well as a couple of other groups. Um, gymnosperms is, is the word we'll see later. Gymnosperms are usually viewed as kind of the opposite of angiosperms, which you see is a word in number three. So we saw some example, we saw pines, we saw firs, we saw spruces. <laughs> Our final group, the angiosperms are the flowering plants. So magnolia ophida are the angiosperms. So they have flowers that then produce seeds. So quick question about these terms. So the very beginning, we saw that we have some typical endings for our different taxonomic levels. Does anybody remember what phyta is? That's fine. I wouldn't necessarily remember either, um, but this happens to be a division. Okay. So reproductive strategies of these different groups. Really, when we say ferns and fern allies, we're thinking about plants that spread by spores. So they're going to spore out, they're going to pass those spores through the environment, through the air, um, and this is their reproductive strategy. Our next group, the gymnosperms, uh, since they saw some examples of these pine spurs, spruces, anybody want to guess what their reproductive strategy might look like or what the reproductive piece of the plant is for these groups? Yeah, exactly. So our gymnosperms are non-flowering seed plants, which means they have cones on them. Which leaves us with the angiosperms, our flowering plants. They're seed plants that have flowers. Can we have a flower in that? So we'll talk about each of these groups in turn in the coming weeks. We're not going to uh, cover everything about each of them right now, um, but these are, are generally the layout for different groups of plants. So we'll kind of progressively be going through each of them. So since we're thinking about systematics, so those are groups, but we, we might also want to pay a little bit of attention to how they're related to each other. So there are more than four plant divisions. Um, there are usually about 14. There's a little tilde in there, an approximation, a waffling in my voice because this is an area of ongoing research, and it's also partially based on 
say like a scientist personality almost. Have you taken evolution classes before or talked about evolution in a biology class? You might have heard about the lumpers and the splitters. Um, this is just a concept that basically says some people like to make bigger groups than others. Some people think that if they look approximately the same, we might as well put them into one group. Those are the lumpers. Some people like to be very, very precise and spit everything out really individually. Those are the splitters. Um, so that's part of why uh, sometimes you'll see more divisions or fewer divisions, but also some people will distinguish between uh, two things. They'll say it's two different species. Someone else will say it's one species. These arguments are, are partially based on this kind of philosophical difference that some scientists have. So here in this branching pattern, though, I uh, do just have our uh, groups that we've been talking about instead of all of those divisions. So we have way back when in the Paleozoic, 500 more million years ago, we have the land plants break off from our ancestors of algae. So on the first day, we kind of looked at an article that was describing some of the more recent discoveries related to this sort of evolution of land plants. Okay. So after we have our land plants, then we're left with our bryophytes, so our avascular plants, right? So we can see that's before this development of vasculature in the plants. So that's where our mosses are. And then we can see this branching between seedless plants really our ferns, so those are spore plants, versus seed plants, which either don't have uh, flowers, making them gymnosperms, or they do have flowers, making them angiosperms. So that's kind of the progression um, of time in which these different traits developed. So next we're gonna watch a little video. Um, I'm not going to test you on the contents of this video, but I think it's a pretty cool sort of uh, relationship between the evolution of our land plants and what's going on in the rest of biology over time. Um, let's see. In the middle of the Cambrian period about 500 million years ago, the face of our planet looked completely different. There was land, but there weren't any plants or animals living on it anywhere. Instead, the dry land was rocky and barren with no shrubs or trees or grasses. But clinging to the rocks and the thin ancient soils was life, just a paper thin film of microbes. These microbes were most likely the only terrestrial life around and have been for several billion years. I just think that these ancient microbial films were probably made up of cyanobacteria and maybe some of the first fungi. And each bacterium was likely doing what cyanobacteria do today, sending out tiny filaments of cells from the main bacterial mat to start new colonies. So the fact is, for a good chunk of Earth's history, cyanobacteria had a monopoly on the terrestrial environment. But life on land was about to get a little more crowded, and those newcomers would end up changing the world. Their arrival would make the world colder and fast, and it would drain much of the oxygen out of the world's oceans. Eventually, it would help cause a massive extinction event in which around 85% of animal species, including a quarter of marine animal families, disappeared from the planet forever. This environmental catastrophe is known today as the end Ordovician extinction event, and it was the first of what we often call the big five mass extinctions in the history of our planet. So what could have caused such a massive global calamity? Well, scientists think it may have been kicked off by the world's first tiny terrestrial plant. Now, we don't exactly know what the first terrestrial plant on Earth was, but we have a good idea of what it looked like and how it lived. Unlike animals, plants tend to leave behind a terrible fossil record. You might get a leaf or a stem, but rarely a whole plant. So the earliest fossil record of land plants isn't parts of their bodies, it's their spores, the particles that ancient plants used to reproduce. Pollen didn't exist when plants first made bloom onto land. 
but there were scores, like the ones you'd see today on a moss or a fern. Back in the 1990s, scientists found lots of plant spores in rocks from Saudi Arabia and the Czech Republic. These spores were dated to 462 million years ago, during that cooling event that took place in the Ordovician period. And they could tell they came from land plants and not aquatic plants, because the spores had a thick covering that all land plant spores have today. This covering protects the spores as they deal with environmental stressors, like wind or flowing water. And aquatic plants don't have that because they don't need it in their environment, which tend to be less harsh. And this covering is also what allows spores to fossilize, along with the fact that they are produced in huge quantities in a variety of habitats. In 2010, even older spores were found in Argentina, and they dated to 470 million years ago. But paleontologists think that the arrival of plants on land actually happened even earlier, based on dates produced by the method known as the molecular clock. By looking at the average number of changes in DNA over time, scientists can calculate when a type of organism evolved on Earth. And this method puts plants on land at least 515 million years ago, right in the middle of the Cambrian period. And it looks like land plants started diversifying almost as soon as they left the oceans. The fossil spores in Argentina weren't just from one kind of plant, but from at least five different kinds, a little community of Ordovician plants. It's hard to know what those plants were based on spores, but scientists can tell they were non-vascular, meaning that they didn't have the system of roots and tubes that many modern plants use to move water and nutrients around. Paleobotanists are still debating on what exactly the first type of land plant actually was, but they agree that it was small and moss-like, probably some kind of green algae or liverwort. And these were pioneering little plants, venturing from the water into conditions where they were at risk of drying out. Scientists think that these early plants probably clung to rocks near the water. There they released their spores, taking advantage of the tide to disperse those spores like their ancestors had done for generations, and gradually transitioning from aquatic to terrestrial life. Over time, through natural selection, they acquired adaptations for life on land, like hard-walled spores and waxy coverings called cuticles that allowed them to become more fully terrestrial. And it looks like their tendency to cling to rocks is what would have spelled disaster for life in the oceans. Today, the scientific name for living material that clings to rocks is cryptogamic cover. And this cover doesn't just sit there, it interacts with the rocks, wearing them down over time and releasing minerals like phosphorus, potassium, and iron. Scientists have used modern cryptogamic covers to see how the first plants might have worn rocks down 500 million years ago. By growing moss on rocks and measuring the minerals released, they found that moss-covered rocks released 60 times more phosphorus than rocks without moss. Once it's freed from the rocks, the phosphorus gets washed away by rainfall, traveling over landscapes and eventually flowing into the ocean. And geologists have found evidence of this very phenomenon in the deep past. In rock formations in modern-day New Mexico and Texas, they found phosphorus in deposits dating to the late Ordovician, when the American Southwest was underwater and just as plants were getting a foothold on the land. And those ancient deposits doomed animal life in the ocean. 
now in the geologic record is how sudden this cold snap was. Starting around 480 million years ago, the planet began to cool, and the temperature continued to drop over the next 44 million years, which is pretty fast in geologic terms. So something else must have been at work to cause that amount of cooling in such a short time frame. And based on the evidence and modern experimental work, it looks like that trigger might have been plants moving onto land. But there's no need to hate on plants because of all of the downstream effects that came with their big terrestrial transition. Sure, the first land plants were the spark that wreaked havoc on ocean biodiversity, but they also paved the way for all the terrestrial life that came after, because those tiny plants set up the conditions for more sophisticated terrestrial life to evolve. They built up a rich soil base through death and decomposition, and they gradually flooded the atmosphere with oxygen. And over time, the plants themselves took over the land. Their roots became longer to tap deeper for nutrients. Vascular tissues began to carry water and minerals around the plant, supporting the growth of much bigger plants. Later, huge changes, like the evolution of flowering plants, transformed the vegetation on Earth into the ancestors of the plants that we see today and use for food. If it weren't for the pioneering little plants that got a foothold on land a half a billion years ago, our planet might still be barren, rocky, and populated by nothing but microbial film. So maybe we can give them a pass for getting the ball rolling on the world's first mass extinction. If you want more EONS content, be sure to follow EONS on social media. Oh, I like how I talk about terrible evil plants, um, but try to convince you that they're not, right? Um, I think it's interesting to think about how development of new forms of life coupled with the dying off of life. And I think it's also interesting to think about these sort of climatic changes in the past, given that we have climate changes going on now. In my more existential moments, I feel comforted that, you know, the earth is going to be fine, regardless of what happens to the climate. I have faith that there will still be life on earth. Whether it's us or not, so so. Um, also, about algal blooms and nutrients in the water, we do still have sort of similar problems on a smaller scale today, right? Fertilizer runoff or goose poop or uh, various things getting into ponds and lakes, creating algal blooms and then creating extremely low oxygen environments still does happen. So it's a kind of process you might want to keep an eye out for if you go on to think about the environment, plants, ponds, lakes in the future. In the middle of the Cambrian period, about by the next slide. There we go. Okay, so now we're going to talk about some plant terms. So basic planting terms. You'll see these three words used often in a sort of agricultural context. So when we talk about annual, annual, perennial, or biennial plants, what we're talking about is the plant's lifespan. So we're talking about annual, uh, like maybe many flowers you plant in a flower garden. An annual is something that lives only one year and then it dies off. And if you want it again next year, you gotta plant it again. A perennial plant is gonna live there indefinitely doesn't mean it never dies. Um, plants do actually have different lifespans. Different species of trees live for different amounts of time. Um, but we're going to have a plant that lives for multiple years if we're talking about a perennial plant. Finally, biennial plants are kind of perennial plants, but they have a very sort of specific life cycle where they have vegetative growth the first year, and then they bloom the second year. So they have different types of growth depending on where they are in the progression. And this does make life a little difficult sometimes for identification. If you have a plant that looks one way if it's one year old, but a different way if it's two years old, um, that's something you need to be aware of. Uh, so that's one of the kinds of variation we may see as we're looking at plants around us. Okay. So starting from the bottom up, won't really be looking at many roots today in the 
greenhouse because we are not going to be digging up our plants. But roots are really important. They function to anchor plants. They allow the plants to absorb water and minerals. And they can also be a storage location for different metabolites, um, things like starches, for example, a carrot is a root, specifically it's a tap root, as we see in this picture here. It's storing um, a bunch of material for the plant for later or for you to eat. When we talk about different root types, we talk about their morphology. We talk about how they're spreading out and where they're starting, so what they're coming off of. The simplest type of root is just when you have one big root that goes straight down. This is a tap root. Um, so a carrot is an example of a tap root. Anything that has just this one straight long stem is, or sorry, straight long root is going to be a tap root. So if it's not too deep, it might be easy to pull up. Um, it depends on the size. Next, we have our fibrous root. A fibrous root. So when we have a lot of roots of approximately the same size spreading out underneath the soil. So many roots, fibrous roots. Finally, we have adventitious root, which is basically weird root. Right? It's a group of strange roots. So these are roots that are not necessarily coming off of the root part at the bottom of the plant. So we can see an example here, but instead of underground with these crop roots, we actually have some roots coming off the stem here. So this might be a sort of subcategory of an adventitious root. Or here in the example of an ivy, we have these roots actually branching out of the stem above ground between leaves, um, grabbing onto potentially a wall wherever they can. So these sort of strange roots that are not fully underground in the normal place for a plant root, we call adventitious. So they're taking advantage of whatever they can. Moving up, we're going to go into the stem. So the stem is the main axis of the plant. You can expect to see the xylem and phloem flowing through here if we're thinking about a vascular plant. Which we are. Stem is usually above ground. Most of the stem is above ground and it's providing support for other parts of the plant. So sometimes we're going to distinguish between woody plants and herbaceous plants. When we do that, one of the main things we key in on is the stem. Um, so, what a woody plant is, hopefully, is fairly self explanatory to you from your lived life, right? Like a tree is a woody plant, it's made of wood. What we're saying there really is that the stem lives for several years, it's hard, it doesn't die back, it's not very flexible. An herbaceous plant would be the opposite. So something that bends over, dies back in winter, is going to be an herbaceous plant. So now we're gonna name some specific parts of stem. Uh, so now it's going to be a time I left some flowers, which are at least partially frozen in my car, unfortunately, but they are going to let us look at some of these trays. So I pass those around. So I'd like you to take a look at the nose and the internode. Take a look at them, appreciate them, identify them. So we're going to call something a node. There's a leaf or a bud attaching there. Sometimes you're going to see swelling in the stem at a node. We're going to see an internode when we have space between them. So sometimes we might be paying attention to how much distance there is between nodes, how big the internodes are. Sometimes we're going to be looking for very specific structures coming out of the node. We're going to see when we look at different leaf types, we're also going to want to be able to key in on where the nodes are. Go ahead and, and pass around the, the flowers and they, they look hopefully fairly off. 
So you're good. Mm -hmm. Or what if you kind of like here where it's kind of like this before? I just kind of go all tricky, but I would consider like that as a kind of, or maybe some kind of that kind of thing. Like that would be an order dog. Yeah, I mean, where we start to We're not into the smell of that flower. <laughs> I don't know. I just there, there was one of the flowers in this room today that smelled really gross to me last night. I did not identify which one it was. It sounded I didn't really think it was one of the ones I brought to class. It just wasn't the smell. I made an effort to not bring the one that I thought was gross. Yeah. It was pretty in pink, but not a yeah. <laughs> I think it's a different yeah. example. Yeah, yeah. Oh, well, like a pink. <laughs> All right, so those are our nodes and our internodes. Another thing we may see on the stem, not in any of these examples, are lenticels. So these are spongy areas where we have gas exchange happening on a stem. So birch trees, uh, where they have those little splashes, that's actually a great example in the environment around us of a lenticel. So what's happening here is we have the bark sort of splitting open and allowing air to mix in um, with the deeper parts of the plant through this sort of enlarged pole, pore. So plants in general have pores, their leaves called stoma. We'll, we'll talk about them in a while, not today. Um, but if we have this enlarged structure that we can see, that's a, a larger part of the plant, that's a lenticel. We may look at some of these on our twigs next week. Okay. Next, we have some structures that are actually modified versions of stems. They're things we typically would associate with roots, which is why I'm letting you know that they're actually technically a part of the stem right now. Uh, so bulbs, tubers, and corms are modified versions of the stem. And so how you can kind of think about this, right, is so here we have our onion, right? So the onion itself is a bulb. You know how the onion has those hairy little rootlets coming down? And those are the actual roots of the plant that are getting nutrients, pulling up water. The bulb itself, the storage organ, it's a different structure. A bulb is just when we have this sort of layered swelling at the base of the stem, underground in this case. A corm is really similar. Um, instead of being layered like an onion, we would have like a previous year's corm kind of below it. So you can see that the stripes here are different and a longitude or latitudinal here. Um, if we see an example of one in, in a plant we actually look at, I'll point it out because I don't really expect most of you to know what a crocus looks like underground. Tubers are these sort of growths coming off these thready things, uh, but they are not roots themselves. So potatoes are a tuber. So they're in among the roots, but they are not roots. And that brings us to leaves. Yeah, we're gonna leaves a lot. Um, so we have a lot of uh, preserved, flattened, collected leaves in our herbarium upstairs. The leaves are going to be the organs of food production for our plants. The leaves during photosynthesis, converting light, glucose, so that our plant can use that for energy. When we talk about leaves out in the environment, we're going to distinguish between evergreen leaves and deciduous leaves. So that's one of the first things we can observe about a plant 
or really observe about a tree mainly here. So the conifers you're looking at are evergreen, right? That's part of why they were a good example to use in the middle of winter. Uh, interesting, at least to me, to note that evergreen trees don't never lose their leaves. Right? They stay green the whole year long, but the reason for that is they're losing individual leaves sort of one by one continuously throughout the year. Kind of like your hair falls out, right? You don't just go bald in the fall and then grow your hair in the spring. <laughs> or at least I don't. <laughs> um, so you are kind of like an evergreen tree, right? <laughs> You're losing hairs all the time, right? At least so says my shower, uh, but you still maintain some hair. That's what's going on with our evergreens, which if you walk through a pine forest um, would potentially be, be pretty obvious too, right? Like they tend to be blanketed with pine needles on the ground, right? So you can tell that they're not, you know, just never losing the leaves. It's just that they don't all drop at once. The deciduous leaves are lost annually. So in the fall, when the leaves turn colors and they all fall off, and then we just have the bare trunks and twigs. Those are deciduous trees. Now we're gonna look at an individual leaf. And if the leaves on the flowers I handed you aren't too frozen, I don't mind if you pull one off and look. We're just going to name some basic parts of a leaf right now so that as we start to describe what these look like in order to identify plants, we know what part we're talking about. So at the tippy tip of the leaf, we have the apex. Whenever we see the word apex pretty much anywhere, right, it really just means that whoever was looking at this thing was thinking about it as a triangle and they named the pointy bit the apex. So that's the same thing for a leaf if we're talking about the apex of the leaf, so that pointiest bit that sticks out furthest. What we refer to as the leaf blade, we usually do use the word blade, but we might also use this technical term lamina. That's what we typically think about like as the leaf in English, right? Like it's just that, that whole broad green structure. Around the edge, of the leaf. Again, this is just a normal English word that we're using to refer to something specific. We have the margin. So the margin of this leaf is just that outline along the edge. So all the way around is the margin. Okay. So the margin in this case is what they were thinking about when they were saying this leaf is roughly triangular potentially. And in the central center, we have the midrib which is our main vein in the leaf. And then coming out from the side, it's gonna have smaller veins. So the pattern of veins in a leaf is going to vary depending on what plant it is. So that's part of why we might look at them. They're not all gonna look exactly like this. They're not all gonna have veins branching off in the group. Finally, at the base of the leaf, we're going to attach to the stem with a petiole. So this sort of stalk of the leaf is the petiole. That would be coming in to a node. Does it have to be like a full stalk or could it be like a point of attachment to the... It could just be a very small point of attachment. And actually, the click on? Yeah. If there's no petiole, we actually describe that and we call it a sessile leaf. So there's a technical term there. The other thing we might draw on, oh, let's see if I made that to zoom. I actually can. Okay. Uh, so we might see at the base here where the petiole attaches to the stem, something that looks like another little leaf. So that would be a stipule, or we might see a bud. So not a leaf like structure, but kind of a, a swelling. So we might see those there at the base of the petiole and the stem. So that's not necessarily a full new leaf. Uh, it, it's this kind of additional structure. And those are gonna help us in determining what counts as a leaf. Which you wouldn't think would be hard, but uh, sometimes it is. 
when I said we don't always have veins branching off a distinct midrib, this is what I meant. So what we were just looking at was a pinnate leaf. So pinnate um, refers to being kind of feather-like is what that means. So in a pinnate leaf, we have this main midrib and then we have our veins branching off the side so that it looks like a feather. Uh, in a reticulate leaf, we'd have the same sort of structure, but then even more little veins branching off. So those are, are kind of similar structures. We call a leaf palmate if it branches out like a hand, like a palm. So here we see we don't have a midrib anymore, right? Mm -hmm. We actually have like five large veins coming out. All like a palm. Okay. Or we might have a series of parallel veins or we don't have a distinct sort of thicker one in the center. They're just all kind of running along. Now, I will tell you, when we get to identifying plants using our trees, my biologist gets really specific. So these are some kind of basic words for structures. Um, but when we're actually identifying plants, I'll be guiding you to some pages in your textbook where they have like, 20 different variations on this more <laughs> to find specific words. Um, but this is kind of the level I would expect you to be familiar with. So when, when you're studying, your book goes into a lot of detail. I would want you to be able to use such a key to identify a plant if I give it to you. Um, the level in the PowerPoints is more the level I would expect you to be able to produce the word pinning without seeing a picture with the label on basically. So fewer things you have to remember the name of, but when we have those bigger lists, you want to be able to use that, right? A very important way, um, usually kind of near the beginning of a key if we're trying to identify something, going to be the leaf arrangement. When we're talking about the leaf arrangement, what we're talking about is along the twig or the stem, the leaves are either going to be opposite each other. I should just keep out this pen, right? So opposite, even with each other, right? Branching out from the same point at the same node, right? Or they're going to be alternate. So you see, we don't have two leaves coming from the same point, right? We just have one coming out to the side here. And then down at the next node, we have a leaf on the opposite side. And this is a really easy thing to observe about a plant. And it cuts down our list uh, really quickly. So this is, this is going to be a very common first or second sort of step when we're identifying something. We also have some weird variations on leaf arrangements because of course we do. Uh, so sometimes you're gonna look at it and you're gonna think, oh, I guess it's kind of opposite. There are many leaves all sort of coming out from the same point spinning around the stem. We call it world. We just have leaves at the bottom of the plant. We call it basal, so the basal leaves. The plants don't always fit these exact specifications but we do our best. Okay, so take a look at those flowers again and uh, judge for yourself whether you think they have alternate leaves, opposite leaves, world leaves. Um, maybe do your best to identify some of those leaf characteristics so that you can stop listening to me talk for a little bit, <laughs> a little bit of a brain break. Okay. Um, 
division really the question what counts as elite <laughs> um so looking at this one on the right if you did not know specific name terms about leaves you might think that this was a leaf and that this was a collection of opposite leaves but that's not actually what's going on here so we can divide plants into having simple leaves or compound leaves. And a compound leaf is going to have like a bunch of little leaves all attached together. A simple leaf is just one single lamina, one single blade. Now, it's all well and good. If I show you a picture like this, right? It becomes a little more difficult when you're looking at a plant occasionally, depending on how big that uh, centerpiece is. So, what you're going to do to figure out whether you're looking at a simple leaf or compound leaf, you're going to look there at the node to see where we have a bud, right? So you'll notice in the simple leaf, the base of the petiole and the stem, that's where we find the bud. If we were looking at this compound leaf over here, right, maybe we think that this is a simple leaf, right? But to figure out, is it a simple leaf? We'd be looking for a bud right here. We can see that there aren't any, right? So that's how we know that these are leaflets that are all part of one leaf. We see the bud way down here at the base of the stem. So that's going to be our, our key in if we have a sort of question mark in our minds. Depending on the species we're looking at, this may be immediately obvious or it may be a little less obvious. A couple pictures of more variation on compound leaves because they're not always going to look exactly like that example. Um, sometimes they're going to look exactly like that picture with one on the point and then a bunch of opposite little leaflets. Sometimes we won't have an end one. Sometimes we'll have groups of three that still counts as a compound leaf. Sometimes we'll have groups of more than three. Uh, that we would just describe as palmately compound, right? Uh, always we're just going to sort of add on shape words in front of compound if we're in one of these other kind of shapes. 
You can also have doubly compound leaves. And in this case, this whole thing is a single leaf that we're looking at here. So here we see that bud, right? So this is a leaflet attaching this uh, central rib, which is then attaching to another one. And then that whole thing counts as one leaf. So doubly compound because it's kind of like a fractal, right? Like we're repeating the same structure kind of over and over. Once we identify how the leaves are arranged and whether they're simple or compound, uh, we're likely going to describe what the edge of the leaf looks like, what that margin looks like. So remember the margin is just kind of the outline, the edges. And the simplest sort of first division or forming a couplet might be something like entire versus not entire, essentially. Although we don't love to use the term not in our couplets. So an entire margin means it's smooth. We have a toothed leaf. We can't get very specific on exactly what the teeth look like. So in your book, you'll see they have like denticulate and crenulated. Uh, serrate is a really common one, like a serrated knife. So that's, that's why I picked this one here as our uh, main example, our most common form of leaf that does not have an entire margin. Or we can have a smooth edge that has some really obvious waviness to it. So this would be a lobe leaf. So like an oak leaf is lobed. Or a maple leaf would be lobed as well. Finally, on our list of terms, I may also describe whether the leaf surface is hairy or not hairy. And if it is hairy, we're going to get very specific. There is a whole big table about exactly what the hairs look like uh, and what the names for that would be in your textbook. For our purposes, we're just going to learn the word glabrous, means it doesn't have hairs, essentially shiny, it's flat. A word for a hairy leaf. We have a field guide that's being nice to us, it just says hairy. If we have a more scientific field guide um, with more technical terms, it will refer to it as pubescent. So that's referring to the fact that we have these hairs coming off. And often we'll want to focus on whether we're looking at the top side of the leaf or the underside of the leaf, because we may have leaves that do not have hairs on the upper surface but do below. Actually, so we're gonna look carefully. Okay, I think that's all we have in these slides for now. And uh, I do like to record lectures just in general because I was never the best note taker in college myself. Um, so I will get this up for you. But what we're gonna do next is we're gonna go up to the greenhouse and just practice identifying some of these terms. Um, do bring some paper with you or I'll bring a stack of paper. One of the things we're gonna do, so we're gonna sort of practice drawing and labeling. Not as an art project, I will not be judging your <laughs> drawings for their beauty, but as a college, I took an architecture class and they made me sit and draw a building for a whole hour. And I have never looked at something so closely before. So it's helpful as we're learning to look in detail at plants. Um, to really focus in a way that's not kind of blank staring. <laughs> uh, so we're going to practice that right now. 